see a lot of faces that I recognize. So uh, this session, this one hour session is going to be about the emerging importance of interfaith relations. It's great to see a few people internationally that are involved in interfaith relations through our government relations plans and our country public affairs plans. And then we also have people, and I know this from Seattle, who work on local public affairs councils where we are very active in reaching out with other faiths as well. So hopefully this will be helpful and hopefully there will be some time for some Q&A at the end of this. Let me start by playing a brief sound bite by Albert Bauer. Nearly 25 years ago, the First Presidency declared, Our message is one of special love and concern for the eternal welfare of all men and women, regardless of religion, belief, race, or nationality, knowing that we are truly brothers and sisters because we are the sons and daughters of the same Eternal Father. That is our doctrine a doctrine of inclusion. That is what we believe. That is what we have been taught. Of all people on this earth, we should be the most loving, the kindest, the most tolerant because of that doctrine. So about 10 years ago, uh, the church became quite heavily involved in building relationships with other faiths. Our objective is to build meaningful two-way relationships with leaders of other faiths that will foster working together in areas of common concern. It's interesting, when I was young growing up in Austria and Vienna, uh, it was a totally different environment. I can't imagine at that time working with other faiths, but I think all of you have witnessed over the last few years really this, this determination to build relationships with other faiths. And so that's what we want to talk about, what we are doing and what we can do on a personal level to build relationships with others. Just give some examples here. The LDS Church's approach is to set up outreach visits as you know, the Quorum of the Twelve General Authorities, also our uh, general church leaders, travel quite a bit. And so now we have been tasked in public affairs, when they travel, to set up meaningful outreach visits with leaders of other faiths. We also host at headquarters. Many other religions that come to town are hosted. For example, just recently we had the Episcopalians in town. And they had a meeting in Salt Lake City. And so we did a lot of hosting for them. And I'll have a short example here in a moment of what, they, what we did with them while they were here in town. Establishing the Faith, Family, and Society Lecture Series at BYU. This allows us to, for BYU and for the church, to invite leaders of other faiths to come to Salt Lake City to come and guest lecture at BYU. And then that also provides an opportunity to host them, to show them the sites, to show them church headquarters, and to arrange for a lunch with church leaders so that more conversation can take place. And then also aligning with organizations that share our vision. The church can't get involved in, in everything, so oftentimes the church aligns itself or works together with other organizations that are involved in specific areas. Let me tell you a little bit about outreach efforts. This, for example, is uh, he's now the Archbishop of Santa Fe. He just recently was the Bishop of Salt Lake City, Bishop John Wester of the Catholic Church. A wonderful man, uh, an important ally for the church. And over many, many years, President Monson and Albert Ballard had very strong relationships with Bishop Wester. 
<laughs> I could give an international example, Cardinal Bergoglio from uh, Buenos Aires, where the church had very good relations with him. And our director of public affairs, Carlos Aguero, who lives in, in Argentina at the time, he had a very good relationship with him. And then, can you imagine Carlos's face when they showed that empty balcony at the Vatican, and when suddenly Pope Francis walks out, and uh, that was Cardinal Bergoglio from Buenos Aires, with whom he had a very good relationship. And Elder Clayton, who's on the Public Affairs Committee, said, I met with him when I was in Argentina, and now he's the Pope. I can move my coat here, sorry. <laughs> Here we have, uh, this is Archbishop John, uh, Joseph Kurtz, who's also the president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. This is our, uh, Archbishop Chapu from Philadelphia. This is uh, Cardinal Timothy Dolan from New York. This is Archbishop Auza, who is the um, what is this, permanent observer of the mission of the Holy See to the United Nations. So he lives in New York is heavily involved with the United Nations. And our couple that is in New York, the Coltons, work very closely with them on family-related issues at the UN. And then, of course, we have Pope Francis, who, as I just recently said, we first had a relationship in Argentina when he was a cardinal. And recently, he invited uh, Elder Perry and uh, see John Taylor and, and who was the other one that was there? Uh, Elder Irene, sorry, President Irene spoke at the Vatican when they had a conference on family matters there. Our outreach efforts also include Bishop Charles Blake, who is in Los Angeles, very influential, influential in African American churches here in this country. You have here Dr. Russell Moore, who is the president of the Ethics and Liberty, the Religious Liberty Commission for the Southern Baptists. You have Reverend Eugene Rivers, who is in Boston, also very influential. Rabbi Greenenbaum, who is recently retired as uh, religious outreach or interfaith relations for the American Jewish Committee. He was, by, for example, very, very influential and helpful in kind of um, bridging the, the misunderstandings that were having be between Family Search and, and the Holocaust victims. He was. We brought both sides together and we were able to come up with compromises that uh, really put that issue uh, to bed. Rabbi Mir Soloveitchik, who's in New York, and we have uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs, who used to be the rabbi of the Commonwealth, very influential, and Reverend Samuel Rodriguez, who's the president of the National Christian Leadership Conference. Hosting at headquarters, now those People have been visited by church leaders out in the field. Here are just some examples of people that have been hosted at headquarters. Ganun Diop, he's the Associate Director of Public Affairs for the Seventh Day of Venice. Dr. Ella and Nord Simmons, she's the Vice President of the Seventh Day of Venice. We have Joel Olstein, who is the Senior Pastor of Lakewood Church. And we have Bishop Scott Hayashi, who is uh, the Bishop of the Utah Episcopal Diocese, Archbishop Chapu. He was here at BYU and spoke at Faith, Family, and Society lecture here. And Archbishop Oza, who visited from New York, and here he is with, uh, also with Governor Herbert. In his visit, he was also taken to the governor. <coughs> here are just some of the organizations the church is aligned with. The Beckett Fund. The First Amendment Partnership, the Witherspoon Institute, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and Humana. So why all of this, you know, why all these relations? And it's interesting because Elder Perry was probably, when he became chairman of the Public Affairs Committee, he was probably the one who was most adamant of how important it was in this age for us to build bridges with these other faith leaders, and for what reason. And one of them I think we heard today, or several of these we heard today in the previous sessions, 
one of them I liked was the, um, oh, it was the, the from Newark. What was it Cody Brooks? Is that it? No. Booker. Booker. Cody Booker. Corey Brooker, sorry. Corey Booker, right? Where he talked about, don't tell me what you believe, show me what you believe. And that is one thing that together with other religions, one of the things we can really do is come together as religions and try to show people the power of religion and how can we together live the community. And so we're seeing more and more of these you know, events or, or these service projects that we are doing together just to show the value of faith. One of the things that has come out of this is a website called faithcounts.com. You can find it at .net.com. But in this, churches are coming together to put together small vignettes about the value of faith in people's lives. And the goal of that is for people to share that on their social media channels just to show what faith can do. And I encourage you to go to that site, faithcounts.com, and just to look at some of these vignettes and share them with your friends. Here's one. Who we are here, by the way. It's the Unit Conference of Catholic Bishops, Seventh-day Adventists, Seek American Legal Defense Education Fund, Hillel International, Franciscan University of Steubenville, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Saints, and the First Amendment Partnership. Now more and more people are joining this group and also coming with up, coming up with their own videos. But then a group of people that is made up of people from all these groups look at, approve, and then it can be put up on the website. And the First Amendment partnership is really kind of the owner and runs this website. Here's a, a piece that was contributed that features Elizabeth Smart. I have a knife at your neck. Don't make a sound. Get up and come with me. If you cry out, I will kill you and your family. I grew up in a family that instilled a very strong sense of faith in me. During the next nine months of my kidnapping, I had no idea just how much I would have to rely upon that faith. I will never forget the first time I was raped. I will never forget how broken and shattered I felt. I felt like I had been a vase that had been smashed far beyond repair. And as I sat there, I began to think about my mom and all the different things she used to say to me came back to my memory, things that gave me hope. I remember her telling me that she would always love me. And then I remember her telling me that God would always love me. It was in that moment that I realized that I still had value, that this was something that nobody could ever take away from me. And it was that faith and that knowledge in God that he would always love me that helped me survive the next nine months. And it continues to help me survive to this day. In my own life and in the countless other lives of survivors that I've spoken with, it has been the power of faith that has allowed us not only to persevere, but to find true peace and happiness. Just by, how many of you know about this website or have ever been there? How many of you have shared content from this website with friends? One person? from Australia. Nobody here, but it had to be all the way in Australia. <laughs> anyway. Here just, this was launched recently, so here, so far what we have seen, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the website. Total followers are 279,149, and total, total video views so far, 7.3 million. No, for the site, yeah. Here just a quote by Elder Cook. My plea today is that all religions join together to defend faith and religious freedom in a manner that protects people of diverse faiths as well as those of no faith. We must not only protect our abilities to profess our own religion, 
also protect the right of each religion to administer its own doctrines and laws. Here are the hills. We are responsible to safeguard these sacred freedoms and rights for ourselves and our posterity. What can we do? What can you and I do? First, we become informed. Be aware of issues in your community that could have an impact on religious liberty. Second, and this is important, in your individual capacity, join with others who share commitment to religious freedom. Work side by side to protect religious freedom. Third, live your life to be a good example of what you believe in word and deed. How we live our religion is far more important than what we may say about our religion. I think that is a key, two key points in this is the church cannot get involved in every religious freedom battle. So often it is us as individuals who have to get involved, who have to become aware of issues. And then second, as we started out, the more we can show how we, our behavior is influenced by religion, by serving and helping others, by following Jesus Christ, I think the more mayors and leaders and governors will realize the value of religion and what religion brings to a community. As I said, the, I think it was the Episcopalians that were just here in town. So as one of the things we did together with them was organize a event at Welfare Square for them to make bread and cheese. That's always a Process. You could call it the square meal, and it starts at Welfare Square. Everybody is smiling. And more and more these days, looking out for the needs of our neighbors often begins with the relationship that exists with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its friends in the faith community. It's very important that people know how much good can be done when faith groups come together. Leaders of the Episcopal Church from around the world and their spouses in Salt Lake City for the annual Episcopal General Convention joined in a service project at Welfare Square to experience firsthand what it's like to produce the basics for any kitchen of those in need. The process of making bread in the bakery, hacking cheese in the dairy, producing gallons of salsa in the canned goods department, all inside Welfare Square. This is an amazingly clean, fresh environment. I think people are really loving it. But there's more satisfaction than just seeing the results of their labor. These items and more will be bottled, canned, and packaged up and shipped out to Hildegard's Food Pantry near downtown Salt Lake City. A special food bank and distribution center operated by St. Mark's Episcopal Church to help the hungry. And today, Nearly $20,000 worth of groceries from the Latter-day Saint operated Welfare Square are being delivered by the leaders of the Episcopal Church. It was nice. I mean, there's nice to have helping hands. We all are a lot more alike than we are different. Working together is a teamwork, and I think that's what God wants. Public affairs, is everybody aware of how public affairs is organized? So in public affairs, we have, of course, the Public Affairs Council at church headquarters, and now Elder Christopherson chairs it. Uh, Elder Perry was the chair before he passed away. And the Public Affairs Council has on it the presiding bishopric, Sister Neil Marriott from the Young Women's Organization, um, Elder Wakeman, general counsel of the church, um, and it has Elder Rasband and Elder Clayton presence of the 70, and it has staff support from the Public Affairs Department. But also every coordinating council and every stake in the church should have a Public Affairs Council of volunteers, priesthood-led councils, that are really mirroring what we do at headquarters and building relationships out in the field with religious leaders. Like, I know there's two people here from Seattle, and are you building relationships with other religions in Seattle? We, we are. In fact, when you mentioned all the Catholic leaders up there, um, it brought to mind the efforts that they made there to, to forge a relationship with Archbishop Sartine, who sits at the Catholic Archdiocese in Seattle. 
So just imagine every stake in the church. Of course, that's the ideal picture, because not every stake has a public affairs council. But really, across the globe, these relationships being built with other religious leaders. And we have marvelous, marvelous relationships across the globe. We have Neville from Australia here. He's been, he and his wife Penny have been heavily involved in building relationships in Australia. How would you say our relationships in Australia are with the interfaith community? I think they're excellent. In fact, I think that uh, through the activities we've been able to become, become involved in, the church has come out, out of obscurity and is now considered an equal partner with people like the Catholics, the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, the Anglican Church. Uh, they just consider us equals and uh, respect us as Christians, whereas probably three, five, 10, 15 years ago, they were very suspicious of us. It's very interesting. What I'll show you here is a few videos we put together for our public affairs councils, which show from, kind of teach people about other religions. But instead of having us tell them about, well, here's what Catholics believe, we went to Bishop, to Bishop John Wester and said, why don't you tell our public affairs people what you think is important for them to understand as they go out and build bridges with Catholics. And so that's where this came from. You'll have a Jewish rabbi, you'll have a Catholic person, you'll have an evangelical person. I'll just go through a series of videos. This, of course, is our very own Bob Millet, who kind of gives a... There's something wonderful about your life when you come to understand another person. And you know what makes them tick, including the things that are most sacred to them. Um, I, I sat in a beautiful cathedral one time with a friend of mine who was a Methodist. It was at uh, his church. And I was just sort of blown away by the beauty of the place. But at a certain point in the service, I happened to glance over and see tears coming down the side of his face. Now, I guess I always knew he was a strong believer in his faith. I had no idea that, that it meant that much to him. That was an important day for me. Uh, it seems so simple. Why didn't I know better than that? I came to appreciate that he values and treasures some things that I value and treasure about my faith. There's something precious about knowing another person, and the more we know about their, their soul, about their, what makes them go, and what, what drives them, what motivates them. Here's John Taylor. We just got to we just got to my portion of the presentation. So thank you, John. Very suspicious. Very suspicious. So, <laughs> let's go to Mormons and Catholics. In essence, the Catholic Church was formed by God's love, in order to. Um, in order to be God's love in the world today, so that God's love might draw all people together into the fullness of the heavenly banquet. Our Catholic faith teaches us that God calls certain men among the faithful for the specific ordained service of God's people. And so these men then would be go to seminary, they would be ordained a deacon, and then a priest. And then as priests, they would be able to celebrate the sacraments, I think the sacraments in general can be misunderstood. To, to receive Holy Communion, the body and blood of Christ, it is truly the body and blood of Christ in sacramental form. The Eucharist is the reenactment, if you will, of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the Eucharist, therefore, is a sacramental um, living out of that reality. It's basically bringing Christ into your life and then having a change brought about in you because you're there. The, the culmination, of course, is the Eucharist in the Mass. That's what everything is leading to. And so when, it, when the priest says, take, eat, this is my body, uh, then you're taking Christ in. You're, you're allowing him into your life so that he can do his healing work. I think people might misunderstand the Catholic uh, relationship with Mary, the Mother of God. Again, people um, will sometimes misunderstand and think that we're worshiping Mary, which we don't. God is the only one we worship. But we afford Mary a very special place as the mother of God, the mother of the church. We are created, Catholics believe, for one thing and one thing only, to be one with God forever in heaven. That God 
loves us beyond distraction, more than we'll ever know, and that God wants us to be one with Him. And that anything in this world that it leads us to be one with God is good. And anything in this world that takes us away from that one goal is not good. Jewish tradition, Jewish belief, um, Jewish belief, it's interesting to talk about Jewish belief as belief. If you took a hundred Jews and asked them what they believe, you might well come up with about a hundred different answers. Judaism is not monolithic. That is to say, uh, every Jewish person that you meet it doesn't believe the same way and they don't affiliate with the same group of people. They don't go to a synagogue that has essentially the same beliefs on any given Shabbat, which is Saturday. You wouldn't expect to go into a synagogue and find people in the synagogue studying the same things. And so there needs to be some sensitivity about the, the basic nature of the two uh, positions relative to authority in Judaism and Mormonism. Um, if you have a different way of reaching God, if you have a different tradition that tells you how to worship God and how to be one of God's children in a positive way, then however you find your way to your God is fine with me. Um, your, your God should be, your way of relating to God should be meaningful for you, just as mine is meaningful for me. Judaism is a tradition um, that is uh, thousands of years old, uh, going back to Abraham. Abraham was, if not the father, certainly the grandfather uh, of the Israelite people. Uh, Latter-day Saints feel a connection with them because we believe that we're quite literally descendants of Father Abraham. Jacob has 12 sons. Um, those become known as the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob wrestles with the angel, and, and the angel, in the course of it, changes uh, Jacob's name to Israel. The Jewish people believe that they're descendants of the forebear of the, the tribe of Judah, Latter-day Saints believe that we're sort of close cousins because we believe we're descendants uh, from uh, some of the other tribes of Israel, predominantly Joseph, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh being uh, his two sons. So I think that Latter-day Saints look at the Jewish people as, um, as family members. And, uh, and that may or may not be true uh, in terms of the Jewish perspective, uh, but I think it's true from the Latter-day Saint perspective. As we get to know people, as we become friends, we build relationships in which we don't want, even unwittingly, to misrepresent each other. We discover ways in which we have uh, lumped all the diverse people of one community together, which is always very easy to do as long as you don't know a single one of them. Latter-day Saints, because we have so many things that have been revealed to us because we have so much through the restoration that brings answers to questions it's very easy for us to become rather insular to become rather linked to ourselves and to kind of hunker down and do our own thing you can't do that if you want to have an impact on the world you can't make a difference unless you get in among the people now we don't have to become like or believe like all the people but we need to be among the people and so i think where the nat natural inclination for a Latter-day Saint is to just take care of your family and do your church jobs, as important as those are, I think we need to find ways to get involved in society. I'm reminded of when it was reported that President Hinckley said to the Latter-day Saints that they ought to get to know their non-Mormon neighbors as well as they knew their Mormon neighbors. And if Latter-day Saints are in a part of the country or a part of the world where they're in a small minority, there should be plenty of people to pick from. <laughs> the same would be true of evangelicals. If there 
are two or more individuals of varying faith communities uh, that have begun to build friendship and establish some trust, the next level is not so much to immediately <coughs> debate doctrine, but share their own personal journeys, share what both of our communities would frequently call our testimonies. How do we recognize God having worked in our lives? What, what has he done? What has he said? How have we changed? Be honest enough to share our disappointments. Many years ago, Christer Stendhal, who had been the dean of the Harvard Divinity School some years ago, Christer Stendhal was appointed bishop of the Lutheran Church in Sweden. And then Bishop Stendhal said this, and I think this is really sound counsel. He said, if you really want to know what another person believes, what they really believe, he said, I have three suggestions. Number one, go to an active, practicing, rather knowledgeable member of that faith. Ask them. Two, he said, if you must compare, compare their best with your best. And three, and I love this phrase, he said, always leave room for holy envy. Now that's another way of saying, be willing to acknowledge the goodness that, that is in the lives and hearts and minds of men and women. Be, be ready to recognize that the evangelicals, for example, are a Jesus-centered people. We can learn something from that. Be willing to recognize that this particular faith has a devotion that is so commendable that you wish you had it. I love that phrase, holy envy. Because we're going out to them, and we really would like them to read the Book of Mormon, there's nothing wrong with us reading about their doctrine, learning about their doctrine, so that we can better together listen, learn, and grow and understand each other. It's interesting because you read some of those things and you go, this sounds like Mormon doctrine. You know, so much is in common. But it is fascinating how much we do have in common, and if we focus on that, and then focus how together we can build up our communities, how together we can protect our freedoms, our religious freedoms. Then we become part of a choir, which the First Presidency always tells us, please become part of a choir. Let's not be out there being soloists. Let's be a choir together on some of these issues where together we can be stronger on these things. Educate and share. The church is constantly posting things on their websites. If you go to mormonnewsroom.org and you click in religious freedom, we have a whole section on there on religious freedom, some very well thought out pieces borrowed from others as well. Get to know these pieces, learn them, read about them, and if you feel comfortable, then you can take these things and share them with your colleagues and say, have a look at this article. Because once again, a lot of it, which deals with religious freedom, they will agree wholeheartedly, and they will feel comfortable sharing what they have with us. And thus we have sites like faithcounts.com where we actually together can come together and post. Become aware of issues. Well, that's, there's issues popping up left and right. We need to become aware of them. We need to monitor so that when they are important issues, Maybe you can get involved, or you know people that are experts in that field. They can become involved. Or it's something you want to tell the priest of the year so they can inform their upline that it's something that the church should really become aware of so that 
in the case that the church would get involved institutionally, that that communication can go up to the priesthood light and then come back down. And then lift communities together. Recently, we launched a service site. Uh, it started in San Jose, California, but it's called JustServe.org. What we've done is we've gone into communities and we've looked for service opportunities. And uh, those are then posted to JustServe.org. And people, families, missionaries, people on the face can go on and find areas where they can help in the community. That's now uh, gone to the entire nation. And uh, if you go in and you look in San Diego, you'll find 220 projects that you could, as a family, get involved in and volunteer or work with other people of other faiths. But, but more, the more we can come together and lift communities, the more we can show the value of faith, which goes back to that first statement, show me your faith instead of telling me what it is. So those are the opportunities we need to look for. Some cautions. I hope most of you here will also go to the other session, that's the, that the anti-discrimination session that's in 2-2 in the big conference room, where they're talking about the Utah Compromise and how that all came to be. But these are, you get involved in religious freedom, it's a very complex issue. You can go into a room and say, who here is in favor of religious freedom? And everybody usually will raise their hand. You throw in one legislative issue, and those hands will start dividing. So there are very many, many nuances involved. So we have to be careful that we don't get the church involved in things that maybe the church shouldn't be involved in. That goes into personal versus institutional. Just to one, one example that happened, a mayor of a large city in the US recently, there was a, a, a law firm that was working for this mayor, and they had subpoenaed uh, some, uh, what do they call it, some, some sermons from pastors. So everybody jumped on the bandwagon. This is terrible, you know. We started to picket and wanted to get our members out picketing and stuff. So then we found out more and more about this case. But this was actually an outside law firm. They had done it. The mayor really wasn't aware of it. Uh, and we actually have built very good relationships with this mayor. As a matter of fact, just last week, that mayor announced Mormon Helping Hands Day in that city. And. Uh, so we just want to be careful that we don't sometimes jump on things. And really, there's a lot more there than we see at first, because oftentimes the media comes in and immediately wants to pit one side against the other side, something that we heard about this morning. So we just have to be careful in what we get involved in and really make sure we have our facts right. So And then carefully assess the level of engagement of what we do. So. Get to know people of other faiths, become friends, work together in your community, educate the community, develop a speaker for your on religious freedom. You may know some good people in your community that could, could speak to Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs, or, or and talk about these issues. Monitor threats in your area of religious freedom and collaborate with local organizations to develop alliances that will speak out on religious freedom. Now, I think we're, I'm going to turn over the time to John. Do you want to say a few words? John's really, he's the director of interfaith relations, so that especially the beginning slides of all these relationships that have been built with key opinion leaders here in the United States, John has been heavily involved with all of those. So. Let me just uh, mention a couple of things. I, and, and Michael's covered it very, very well, that, that those relationships are absolutely critical in nature. And uh, the, uh, those, those friendships are things that, uh, that we have found to be very critical and important. As a matter of fact, when, when the senior leaders of our church have gone out, uh, the goal has not been massive numbers. The goal has been to develop uh, relationships, two-way relationships, where discussion and, um, and friendships and, and then focus on 
issues of commonality can then be a part of it. Let me just share one experience with you, uh, a thing that I personally experienced uh, that, uh, that, that bonded uh, myself with a number of evangelical pastors. Um, uh, we had a, a significant evangelical um, a speaker come and, and speak at uh, a BYU forum and uh, uh, invited a number of the uh, uh, evangelical pastors in Utah to come down and experience that with us. And so we made arrangements for special seating and they came down and, uh, and sat the, uh, with us uh, on the main floor of, uh, of the Marriott Center. And uh, a day before, I had uh, been trying to do something on my car, and I don't have to do much sometimes, you know, and I don't know what brings it on, but anyway, when I reach like this sometimes, uh, and, and I uh, did something to my back. And so there I was as I entered the Marriott um, Center and greeted my evangelical friends. I was walking about like this, and, uh, and they noticed that. And uh, we went through this wonderful experience together, and there was a, a, a luncheon that was uh, to be hosted afterwards by, by the administration of Brigham Young University. And I had uh, four of those ministers come up and corner me. They said, uh, come with us for a minute, would you mind? And uh, they walked me back into the recesses of uh, the Marriott Center, and they said, uh, we just felt like we needed to pray for you. You're back. So there, uh, at the Marriott Center, I was standing there, my arms around these good, good gentlemen, and uh, they uh, offered a prayer for John Taylor's back. And you know what? The next day, it felt a lot better. Well, I think that's just the kind of example of, of the sweetness and the friendship that existed. And uh, probably the best example that we had of this I'm sure Michael mentioned this, was Elder Perry. I used to joke with Elder Perry, as we'd go out to these visits, I'd say, you know, Elder Perry, you're my secret weapon. He'd kind of look at me and smile and go, nah, I know what you're talking about. I'm just a, a kid from, from Logan and all of this. But uh, Elder Perry would walk in and, uh, and people would just become endeared with him because of what they felt and just the way he loved people. And that, as you went through these significant leaders nationally of different faiths, is what began that process. And so if I could just reiterate what Michael has said, it first comes to getting to know people and to, and to becoming friends and to understanding them. And uh, as Bob Millett talked in one of the videos about looking at his friend, the knew was spiritual, but didn't recognize he has had the deep feelings as tears ran down his cheek. I've had similar experiences as I've, as I've sat with my Episcopal friends and my, my Jewish friends and, uh, and others. Just one last experience, and then we'll open up to any questions that you have. About four or five weeks ago, um, I had the privilege of being with Elder Cook and uh, Elder Von Keech, who many of you know, back in New York. We attended an event. And uh, we developed some, some meaningful relationships with uh, many of the Jewish leaders who are based back in New York. And uh, we had a wonderful invitation someone from one of those dear friends to come to uh, his home uh, for Shabbat dinner. And so on Friday night, uh, we went over to uh, their New York apartment. And as we came out of the elevator, the door was open as it always is, for Shabbat dinner. We went in, and he and his wife, and he had invited a couple of other very close Jewish friends of his uh, and their spouses to attend. And we had probably one of the most remarkable evenings together as we, as we came to understand more fully um, the uh, traditions of our Jewish friends as we sang together, as we ate, as we um, talked about the significance and the deep feelings. And the way these good, fine, wonderful friends of ours uh, were trying to teach 
their children and the next generation about the importance of faith in their life. And so, anyway, it can be probably one of the most rewarding experiences of your life as you look at this and uh, develop these relationships. And then we come together for common causes. And religious freedom has been a significant element for the leadership of the, of the other so, with that, Michael, well, anything just, else? One, one more thing. I just noticed that Corinne Doherty from Philadelphia is sitting here. She's one of our great stars. Yeah. She is, she's a, she's the coordinating council director of public affairs for Philadelphia. She also sits on the interfaith board of Philadelphia. But this year, the, is it the week of the family? What's the Catholic? It's it's the world, meeting. War, world meeting of families is coming to Philadelphia and the youth will be able to go to a family search booth right to find their ancestors thanks to Corinne and, and all the efforts she has done but could you just take a moment and talk about your your experience as kind of being on a board and some of the things that work well but also some of the challenges what are some of the challenges that we could face as members of the church when we try to reach out but sometimes it can be hard. Well, why don't you come up for a moment? I had a feeling Michael would do this. Um, he does it often, people, so you're all on notice. There's, there's a couple things I've been thinking about. Um, one is, um, we as Latter-day Saints, we... Um, act and behave in certain ways. Um, we don't go out and pick it. We don't um, generally um, publicly take stances. And so oftentimes when we are working with interfaith groups, it's a little bit challenging to know where to draw that line. And so um, um, whether it's a candle vi candlelight vigil or anything, I think that we need to be a little bit more flexible in where we draw that line because there's some things that we should probably do more of that we as a culture don't do enough of. Um, but I think that you need to work, kind of work through that as, as an individual and where you get involved and not. Um, and I'm still a little bit working through some of that. Um, so I think that that flexibility is something that we as members um, need to be a, a little more um, familiar with. But I've been thinking a little bit about religious freedom, and so it's really terrific to be able to develop these great relationships. Um, but it's even better if you have an opportunity to influence. And so I've been on the board of the um, center, the Philadelphia, um, the Interface Center of Greater Philadelphia for a year, and they invited me a year ago to join the board. I had been involved with them a little bit um, through my calling in public affairs. Um, but uh, I was I'm the first LDS member on their board. And we have, um, this just in the last few months, we had um, anti-Muslim advertising that came to Philadelphia on our bus systems. And so last December, when we knew all of this was going to be possibly coming, we had been talking about, uh, a, as a board, of what we would do and what our response would be. And you can guess that there could be all different kinds of responses to this anti-Muslim campaign. We have many Muslim brothers and sisters on our board, um, and so we want to support them, but how do we do that? And I had the opportunity to present at a board retreat in December the, the church's response to the Book of Mormon musical. And so if you're a little bit familiar with that, right, the Book of Mormon musical has been out going across the whole country, but the church as an institution did two things. One is we put out one statement that said, and I'll paraphrase it, that if you, um, if you, you can go to the musical and be entertained for an evening, but if you um, read the Book of Mormon, you'll be uh, influenced by Christ for, for life. And that was the only statement that we came out with. We didn't talk to the media. We didn't, we didn't promote it. And then we also put um, ads in the playbill of all of the advertisers, of all of the publications, of all the productions, sorry, that said, um, You've seen the play, now read the book. And so I shared that with my interfaith board of those things that we did. And then on a local um, basis, when um, the Book of Mormon was in Philadelphia, 
we uh, worked with the media and promoted really great stories of what missionaries really did and what their service was and, and what they spent their day doing. And so it was being able to share this and have a conversation with the Interfaith Board um, about our approach and how, um, as they described it, it was very mature and it was very professional um, as opposed to picketing and marching and um, causing a little bit of ruckus. Um, and so our approach for the anti-Muslim campaign when it came out was very positive. We used the tagline, Dare to Understand, and we talked about interfaith, and we talked about understanding everybody as opposed to um, anything negative. And so I've thought a little bit about um, how we not only build relationships, but then what can we do? And I think as Latter-day Saints, if we can influence the approach that we take to religious freedom or we take to different issues or um, problems in our communities, if we can help influence that approach so that it's a very positive and uplifting approach, um, because I don't think people naturally go there. I think that's one of the things that can be very unique, unique for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, see why we love her. See, you'll get a blast for it. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Please. We, um, th these have been great experiences that have been shared. My question is, because some of many of these experiences, maybe all of them, have been based on what the LDS Church is doing as an institution, what about rank and file people? How can they uh, take this notion of, of building a broader coalition and do something about it? Excellent question. Let me maybe just give one example, and that's a brother in the Monterey State. He's got an appropriate name. His name is Doug Humble. Well, he went out and uh, built relationships with the black churches in the Monterey area. And this has led to this amazing event, yearly event now, where these uh, the black churches, the LDS churches, now the Hispanic churches have joined as well come together, the church sends 1,500 frozen turkeys, the Hispanic community sends beans and rice, and the African American churches have started with fast offerings and a clipboard. They learn what does it mean to hand a clipboard around in church. That means that you sign, you sign your name and you'll come and volunteer. But because he wanted to make a difference together with others, these churches have now come together and are working together to lift the community. Now when it comes to what that has led into is that six of the pastors have come to visit Salt Lake City and actually met. We had a uh, lunch, I think it was in the Lion House. By the way, it is great to have lunch with them because they'll say something and they'll go, well, is nobody going to say amen? So before the lunch was over, Elder Perry kept saying, Amen. <laughs> but, you know, and we were able to tackle religious freedom issues as well and talk about the need to be able to have our religious beliefs and, and be free to believe what we wanted. But they also said, you know, we have to come and confess. We have taught some very bad things about Mormons over the pulpit. But as one of them said, Reverend Lostkip, I have come to learn that Mormons are people too. <laughs> so, you know, it's oftentimes community service getting together can then also lead to a conversation about religious freedom. But it's so good to have a trust built and, and have the friendships built that we're able to safely say what we want to say. And, and, and they, I believe, have distributed our materials on religious freedom in their con congregations as well. So. Let me give you another example of how that works. Uh, I think during the presentation, uh, Michael uh, showed you a picture of uh, Reverend Gene Rivers and his wife Jackie. Uh, they are magnificent uh, individuals and uh, hold a uh, significant position and a great deal of respect within the, the six or seven branches of, of 
of black churches here in the country. And so, um, again, it started out by hosting them and getting to know them. And I can remember we went, that they're both, uh, both Jackie and Jean are Harvard educated. And uh, we went to uh, uh, Elder Christofferson and uh, uh, actually it was Elder Rasband and Elder Perry and I went and met with them uh, on the Harvard campus had lunch together with them and uh, started a magnificent relationship. Well, since then, let me tell you what's happened. The Rivers have formed what's called the Seymour Institute. And it's uh, an organization, it's based out of Harvard, that focuses on religious freedom. And it is specifically focused on uh, religious freedom as it relates to um, the black churches here in the United States. And so, uh, once again, they have been very influential visionary in their approach. In, in moving forward in that area. And it all started with uh, some simple conversations and getting to know them. And, and Corinne, I, I give Corinne a lot of uh, credit too because um, many of the institutional relationships that we have now um, were started local. So just understand, Gary, when you talk about, well, what can I do? I think uh, uh, Elder Hills spelled it out very well. You know, we need to study, we need to understand, we need to monitor and, and see things, and then we need to reflect who we are in our actions and our deeds. And as we do that, it's amazing to me how doors are open. And uh, I have this little um, uh, glass globe uh, in my office, and uh, the staff refers to it as the crystal ball, because we can do all this wonderful planning and all of these other things, but sometimes our Father in Heaven uh, just drops things in our laps, and so we have to be, well, he does a lot. Uh, we have to be flexible, and we have to, uh, we have to be willing to take those, uh, those steps and do those things. I know we've had some wonderful experiences with Robert, uh, and, 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 and again with our friends down here at BYU with Gary and others, where doors have been opened and things happen, and we move in the direction that uh, that I think our Father in Heaven wants us to. And uh, we don't have a corner of, on goodness as members of the LDS Church. Uh, it's all of these wonderful, magnificent people of faith that come together and can have a significant influence. Yes, please. Um, I'm currently living in Saudi Arabia. That was, that was a long answer. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm currently uh, teaching in Saudi Arabia. And um, it's been a phenomenal experience, I can't say enough. But anyway, that's a whole different thing. But, so my question, obviously, I'm more tuned to the Muslim um, faith at the moment. And so I noticed they were suspiciously missing in the relations. Is that because simply there just wasn't enough time to put everything on there? Or because that's been more difficult to develop? Or because X, Y, Z? Um, and let me just let me just continue that the one of the reasons I'm very concerned about this is because I notice among my family members I've been writing home a lot because they've been very concerned um, that you know some family members are a little more receptive than others um, and so there is a definite very negative the media has bred a lot of hatred and bad feelings and so um, I guess the I guess the bottom line question is. What about the church relationship? Um, let me just let me just mention a couple things about that. Um, uh, I think I think part of it is yes, um, we didn't put up there a number of those relationships that we have, have been developing within the Muslim community. It's been um, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of the next phase of what we're doing, and we're moving forward can't do everything all at once, but I can tell you that we have hosted a number of uh, significant Muslim leaders in Salt Lake and started to develop those relationships. There are some real challenges as it relates to, you know, we, we have to stay away clearly from proselyting and those kinds of things. But I'll tell you, um, when you look at family values, when you look at commitment to, to parenting, when you look at commitment to, uh, to, to the importance of the family, when you when you look at many of the, the, the issues that we, that we um, are concerned about, uh, our Muslim brothers and sisters are with us. And it's been a very sweet experience for me. It's developing, it's getting stronger, 
Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've been a little cautious, but we've been cautious with all of these relationships as we move forward, but it's uh, really paid some, some wonderful dividends. And I know that in, in many of the local communities across uh, our country and internationally, we've, we've done some significant outreach. Let me just give you one quick example. There was an evening hosted in the United Kingdom by Elder Holland. And uh, we had probably, what, 26 uh, Muslim leaders that came together throughout the United Kingdom and uh, had a discussion about religious freedom. And so um, I think that's a good example. Uh, was the last one? The time's over. On the day, address your question on Wednesday um, when we talk about case study Brazil. We're going to be talking about during that presentation a major <clears throat> religious freedom event in a Muslim mosque where Elder Christofferson was a keynote speaker. And, that, and we'll talk about what, what happened there and what's the, the upshot of that. I knew, I knew that was on the program, Greg, and I didn't want to steal <laughs> your thunder, so I'm happy you revealed it. Our time is over. And and can I just say one thing? I'm so sorry, Ted. Just, just no, 10 no. seconds. Um, that, this was no way meant to be a criticism oh. at all. Just that I'm noticing the same thing that as I um, converse with my um, Muslim colleagues that we are developing some really amazing relationships and learning things about <coughs> each other that we had no idea that existed. So and, and no, 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 not taken that way, please. Uh, also, uh, it's kind of exciting because we've, we're seeing some developments even with faith council. We had a very strong SIP relationship there with the we're seeing our Muslim friends. What's happening? It's an evolution. Thank you all.